What is Marcus Samuelson's secret weapon when it comes to cooking? If you're a young black chef, you're gonna do it in New York. New York is open and ready for that. When I didn't get the contract, he taught me that no one owes you anything. If you could have anyone to dinner, who would you love to have at your dinner table? <laughs> Hey family, hope you're all doing well. Hey, welcome back to the Carlos Watson Show. Now coming up, we've got our latest and greatest from A to Gen Z segment, featuring our friend from iHeartRadio, of course I'm talking about Sammy J, and her latest discovery, a young man named Ziad Ahmed, stories on the way. But first, if you live in the Miami area, where I'm originally from, you know that Marcus Samuelson's restaurant, Red Rooster, is the hottest thing going on right now. So of course, we invited him to come on the show, talk about that, his incredible one-of-a-kind life story, and much more. Hey, maybe we could even get him to do a little demo for us. Let's find out and see. This is my guy, my main man, my good friend, Marcus Samuelson. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Marcus? Hey, how are you? I love where you are. Where are you? That looks beautiful. I'm in Miami. Bienvenido. Nice. Okay. You know what I love about being here in Miami is, you know, it's really the melting pot of Bahamian culture, Cuba, of course, Haiti, and infusing the Caribbean into the Red Rooster brand a lot. So it's changed our food a lot. So that's been fun to exploring that in a more tropical sense, you know, with fruits and foods and stuff. Did you have any experience previously with that kind of Cuban fare or that kind of more broadly Latinx uh, uh, slash Caribbean fare? So I've traveled all over the Caribbean. I've traveled, I've cooked in Cuba, I've cooked in Jamaica many times, Bermuda, Bahamas. And now we kind of got to do a deeper dive and own some of those things in, in a better way. But it's also that great thing with staff. Our leaders here are in the community and of the community and guided me constantly through how can we make this Red Rooster speak its own language, if you will. Are you gonna cook? Yeah, I'm set up here for you. I wanted to do something that is, is definitely inspired by Latinx. So it's really a tuna ceviche. On one hand, I'm glad you're doing it. On the other hand, it is slightly cruel because you realize that you now have maybe all yeah, kinds of yeah. hungry. But, but let's watch the magic as we go. So a couple of things. When you buy any type of seafood, you always want to buy sushi quality grade A. No matter what, whether you're a chef and you buy for a restaurant or you're buying for friends and family, you go to your store, always create a good relationship with your fishmonger. I got a beautiful piece of tuna here that I'm just gonna quick sear, right? So I'm just gonna put my pan on high heat. And then when I say sear, I'm just kissing it in the pan like that. In this bowl, that's really where I got Miami. I got a little bit of heat, a little bit of black pepper, uh, but I got Cuban coffee and we ground it. And that's what I'm gonna rub this guy in with. A lot to get crusted by this. First of all, what is Marcus Samuelson's secret weapon when it comes to cooking? Being able to stay curious in my field. The only way to do that is to travel, you know? You're talking to a guy that left home at 18 to go to Japan. A little black kid in Japan <laughs> cooking, you know, it's all based on curiosity. I'm super curious about where's food heading? What's just around the corner? What's the intersection between food and tech? Where's food going next? You know our restaurant, it's here in Miami. Right next to the restaurant, we have this outdoor place. We put in hydroponics for vegetables. So in one of the poorer area in Miami, we have the highest technology. We want the best vegetables and herbs and urban farming to our guests, but also so our staff can learn. Seared off my tuna, I sliced it. Now you see this technique is called tataki, and it's just seared on the outside, that's Japanese technique. I got this hydroponic, beautiful uh, watermelon radishes, a little bit of pea shoots. So we're gonna do this kind of like bed of light salad right here. And then I had a little bit of soy and some of that coffee, and I'm just gonna kiss this. I'm just gonna glaze this up like this. And then I'm just gonna fan out this incredible tuna here and layer pink grapefruit, oranges. A little tuna tzatzki rubbed with Cuban coffee and this beautiful vinaigrette with coffee, citrus, with watermelon radish. You're constantly around people. 
uh, you've lived in different parts of the world, so you also can yeah. see it operate differently. What's the most beautiful place you've ever been to in this world? Places in South Africa. It's something about the earth in Africa, that red clay, um, the smell, the, the connectivity to the animals. Uh, that just gives you, it humbles you. It's very often when you're outside the city, you just see, you wake up in the morning, you're just like, God, it's beautiful here. Uh, but I can also appreciate, you know, um, a place like, you know, the 700 Islands with Bahamas. When you go outside and you go to some of these places where you, you're in the middle of the ocean and you're like, oh my God, this is beautiful. I appreciate also being in a place like Tokyo on this incredible journey, being able to discover the world and eaten all over the place, whether it's been in Russia or it's been in Singapore or, or, or Tokyo. Are you an Airbnb guy? You done a little Airbnb getaway or found a little treat yeah. for yourself? My Airbnb is in Stockholm. You can stay in Gamla Stan, which is an old city. And it's just the right amount of people so you can get that urban sense, but also nature, it's access to nature. Uh, what about in Miami, which, as you know, is my hometown? Uh, have you discovered anywhere there? Miami is the, the key, actually, to hi a hideaway. You know, like, I love Miami River. When I'm leaving the restaurant, I bike up, just biking through Overtown, watching the beautiful murals that are here. And then you bike over to Wynwood, where you have some of the best street art in the world. And pop over to Zach the Baker. Then maybe you go over to Panthers Coffee and just park the bike and walk. You can look at um, Windward Walls. So this urban sense of uh, creativity where this thing that we didn't allow in terms of graffiti that was born out of the Bronx and born out of hip hop, that we now consider the most highest art in the world. Only urban America can develop that. And that's the beauty with our culture. Marcus, how have you changed as a chef over the last uh, decade or two? I mean, I know you were the youngest person ever to get three-star rating in the New York sure. Times for a kid born in, in Africa, raised in Europe, sure. trained in Asia, living in North America. I mean, if ever someone was a global citizen, it's you. I've been able to work in some of the top restaurants in the world. And being in those rooms taught me many things, but I realized I was constantly the only one. As black people, we know when we enter a space, when we're the only one. And when you achieve a certain success in your industry, you gotta say like, hey, what can I do to change that narrative? And I said to myself, if I'm gonna be in this city, if I'm gonna keep cooking, it's gotta have a purpose. Basically six months later, I moved to Harlem. I really studied the community. I was always set about building a restaurant, but I felt like I needed to learn, how can I be in this community, of this community? And it started with me building the restaurant, creating jobs, building a food festival, engaging the community in the four walls of the restaurant, but also outside the restaurant. And then obviously, with the social justice conversation we've had in this country last year, coming out with my book, The Rise, was really highlighting black chefs in America. All of those things are evolved products that I've learned along the way, so we can have a more food justice, better conversation that we can have a much more equitable and being, being part of the dem democratization of great food. Marcus, take me back to growing up in Sweden. And, and for those who don't know the story, give them a little taste of you being born in one place, but then growing up elsewhere. We were fortunate enough to get adopted to family in Sweden. And yes, we were a mixed family, but when it came to love and knowing who my parents were, who was in charge, and my grandparents and my uncles, uh, we were very fortunate last. And it was very difficult in terms of identity because as an adopted child, I had the benefits of growing up in an upper middle class neighborhood, but I didn't know necessarily my Ethiopian identity and culture. But I think, first of all, as a part of living is figuring out yourself and appreciating the challenges and being appreciating of the people that give you that love. And I've always felt love. My sense of confidence came from my Swedish mother. Our father, you know, he was a geologist, traveled the world. He was much more strategic in his thinking. If you're a young black chef, you're going to do it in New York because that, you know, New York is open and ready for that. The Our Home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly.
How do you decide that you were going to become a chef? My grandmother taught us how to cook. My summer jobs were always around food, whether I was fishing or selling fish sandwiches. But sports was a big part of my life. And I always thought I would be a professional soccer player. I still view myself as a failed professional soccer player. And when I didn't get the contract, which was a shock to me, it taught me that other kids work hard too. No one owes you anything. Don't take anything for granted. And I don't want to feel like that again, you know. And so a lot of this has been working towards not that feeling again. Marcus, if you could have anyone to dinner who would you love to have at your dinner table for whatever combination of reasons definitely nelson mandela because that level of restraint being in jail so long and then coming back out and inspiring the world changing the world uh you know i grew up loving soccer so i would probably love to have diego maradona on that table with a couple of friends i would definitely have another table with my parents you know i lost my I lost my Swedish father very young. There's so many conversations I would love to have had with my father. And I, I just miss him dearly. And I, it's a long time ago now, but it, it never really healed. I love the image of that. Um, uh, Marcus, tell me about the most interesting things you've learned in this life about love in particular. It's unconditional and different, right? The love I have for my son and wife, my anxiety. The different love that you have for the extended family and your community, right? On my block during the middle of the pandemic, we as a community, we got the chance to shut down our block, no cars, and all the parents in each house, we had to talk about what skills that we had, and every parent had a different skill. So it became a community, basically kindergarten for kids during this pandemic, and we're closer today, Carlos, as a community because of the pandemic than we were before. Growing up, uh, in, a, in a wealthy white home. What do you think you learned and saw there that a lot of black people, maybe myself included, who didn't have that experience, what did you see that you would share with us? As a black person with the privilege of growing up outside the United States, we owe so much to African Americans, whether it's music, whether it's art, it's so much of that starting point really comes out of the continent. Why African-Americans did was took that and broadcast it to the world. And that's the beauty of America. I choose, I'm an, a true immigrant to America. I choose, I'm not a refugee. I choose to come to America. And it's the best decision ever in my life because I learned more about myself and I evolved. It's not that one black experience is better than the other. We're just different, but we all share so much. And, uh, you have to acknowledge your privilege, but then once you're in this, you gotta do the work. We're always talking on this show about dreaming fearlessly and then bringing those dreams alive. And in many ways, you've talked a lot about it today in, in a lot of variety of ways, but, but, but what would, what's the most interesting thing you've learned about not just dreaming fearlessly, but making those dreams happen? Looking backwards and looking forward at the same time, right? So backwards, I, I look at my family's history. Being born in a hut, once I understood that, you can draw strength from that. Have, you know, we still have my father, Swedish father, family home. Very simple, fisherman family. Not being fear of that poverty, but then at the same time, dreaming dreaming far and dreaming big, right? So what, and then asking for enough help because there is a map and there's a map and compass. And as a kid, you don't have the tool to connect the map and compass. So I love dreaming big and I've always done that. But then having the foundation of that hut and that fishing village with me every day, wherever I go, but then also like, Always being a little bit hungry, right? Because when that hunger game is over, you die. All right, I'm gonna finish you up with some rapid fire. The best dish you've ever had. The best dish I've ever had was the first time when I was in Japan. I'm 18 and I'm having blowfish dinner. I collected money for a year just to get to the place. And I'm now there. I'm not climbed Mount Everest in my mind. And the second one, was working in Switzerland, playing the seven course vegetarian tasting in 93. It's like when I heard 
prince for the first time. Like, there's now a new level of excellence. What are some cuisines that we should keep our eye on that have not been part of the main fair, but you think are worth enjoying and watching and getting to know? There's something about Filipino food that is just makes it so unique and rich and so interesting. You know, when I think about South America, I think about Peru. There's just some amazing food in Peru. And then what's coming from Lagos, black chefs that have been to the States, been to France, to come back to Lagos and building some of the most unique food. This podcast that you are doing with a good friend yeah. out of Sweden, tell folks who don't know about it, why are you doing it? I just think with, with everything happened with this iconic year of 2020, that we're learning now how to create empathy, you know, so we're all coming out of this the best way we can. And the black narrative in this is very unique. So telling great stories. The impact of Oprah Winfrey, I mean, we yeah. can speak about that for a moment. That the, the, just the power of, of her, you know, word and her platform is amazing. What's your best story of cooking for someone famous? When Obama came to Red Rooster, it was an amazing responsibility. And, and I was so happy and proud and honored to be part of that. He had left the building and everything gone well. And I was like, I need a drink. <laughs> I love that. Hey, Marcus, thank you for joining me. You know I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being curious. Marcus Samuelson, Food Thoughts, take one. Margaret. I liked him because I love Ethiopian food. I was really excited to have him cook on the show. He made fish. So it's like not a very traditional plate when you go to Ethiopian restaurants. I was hoping he would teach us that red sauce. Oh, <laughs> that you dip in, at the, in, the, in the bread and things. So I was, like, I was hoping he would do that fish recipe. I thought it was okay, but it wasn't. I was looking forward to the secret sauce. Oh, you want the extra extra. Yes. Yeah, Marcus was, uh, he was dope. He's uh, like any chef. You don't gotta say much. <laughs> it's all in the taste. There's no judgment in character, and the character can only come out through the food. So experiences come out through the food of nourishing another human being. I think that's beautiful. But one thing that I stuck in my head was how cool it would be to continue doing like interviews while say like artists are practicing their crafts. Because the way that he communicated throughout the interview was very different than when it, during the beginning when he was still like cooking and trying to like teach us. Right. Uh, it reminded me of like Bob Ross videos and I'm curious to see what other parts of like personalities you can get if we're interviewing them while they're kind of like preoccupied with like their passion or their craft or their hobby, things like that. Hey, that was Marcus Samuelson. I, I, I'm such a big fan of his. I think he is so thoughtful and entrepreneurial, big hearted, big minded. I love his global background and experience. Born in Africa, raised in Europe, trained in Asia, building something beautiful here in North America. And I love how he puts all that together. Um, listen, now as we promised, it's time for our From A to Gen Z segment. Now this is a recurring segment we've got on the show featuring Sammy J from iHeartRadio and some of the coolest, most interesting people from the world of Gen Z. Let's see who Sammy J wants to put on our radar today. Take a look. Hey. Whoa. Hey, Sammy. Hi, Carlos. I love our segment A to Z. I love meeting Gen Z and cutting edge people who I think are going to help uh, set not just the future, but the present. Yeah. So who do you have today? I'm so excited to introduce you to Ziad Ahmed. He is the co-founder of Juve Consulting, which is a Gen Z focused marketing company for Gen Z by Gen Z. And he's really changing the narrative and allowing Gen Z to be a part of the conversation. Sammy, way too kind of you, but hi, Carlos. Hi, Sammy. It's so good to be here and I'm excited to chat. So what made you start thinking about starting a business so early? I started a nonprofit actually when I was at the end of eighth grade called Redify. And we create resources and information to make communities and schools more equitable and inclusive. And as a result of starting Redify, I found myself in a lot of rooms that I didn't know existed. At the White House, with industry leaders, et cetera. And you know, as the youngest person in the room often by two decades. And I realized sort of how often people are talking about young people, but not to us. So my junior year of high school, I got together with some friends and said like, there shouldn't be youth experts who are consulting on us. Like if anyone should have a seat at the table about Gen Z, it should be Gen Z. 
The core philosophy that I live by is that the expert on any reality is the person closest to that reality. And so those truths in my lived experience really led me to founding Juve Consulting really as a side project as a junior in high school five years ago. None of it's easy, but it feels like you've got such an entrepreneurial motor and nature. Where do you think that comes from? You know, I think a lot of it stems from, frankly, privilege in, in my journey and in, in, in my upbringing. You know, I've had such amazing access to education, to mentors. I am the product of what it looks like when kids are invested in. That is why I am such an advocate of trying to get companies, getting campaigns, getting nonprofits, getting everyone to invest more in young people. But I also think that, of course, like, yes, I am a go-getter and I am hungry and I am passionate and I am all of these things. But I think that I've been allowed to be. Sammy, what draws you to Ziad? Well, something that I've realized is the hardest part of doing anything is starting. We all have a million dollar idea. It's a matter of acting upon it. And something that I've always really respected and admired is that, Ziad, you won't stop until it's done. Ziad, what's been the hardest part of, of building and running something? I think it's been a year for a lot of us of a lot of reflection, right? I look back and if I could go back again and do it differently, I would. I think that surprises, you know, a lot of people and surprises me, right? I did a lot of the things that I set out to do. I, I've done more, frankly, than I set out to do, but I missed out on a lot of in-between moments. And I think in many ways, we're seeing a generation come up that is missing out on a lot of those things because we are under so much pressure to be excellent, to be informed and to be everything all of the time. The verdict is in, in the trial of Derek Chauvin. The former Minneapolis police officer was found guilty today of killing George Floyd last May. Tell me a little bit about um, how you thought about Derek Chauvin's yeah. uh, trial and the decision there. It's hard to even articulate, you know, how, how continuously disappointed I, I feel in our country, in our systems. They continue to not only just like let us down, but actively attack right, vulnerable communities and actively attack, you know, black communities specifically. Do I think that the guilty verdict was the correct one? Absolutely. Do I think that we should be celebrating the bare minimum? I don't know. I'm probably more angry than I am anything else, right? Just that like we are even still grappling with all these questions that I will for the rest of my life, that this is lifelong work, that like being actively anti-racist is not something that is just like a 2020 thing. This is a forever thing. I want to be able to say with confidence that when I bring kids into this world, that it will be so much better, that they will be safe and loved and protected regardless of the color of their skin or who they love or how they pray. But I don't know that I can say that with confidence. And that is so outrageous. And I think in the case of Gen Z, we are looking at a generation that is really angry and, and righteously furious. I think at the world that we're living in and how many people are still hurting and the lack of action on climate, the lack of action on racial justice, the lack of action on mental health, the lack of action on gun violence, the lack of action on so many issues that we care so dearly about because they're quite literally claiming lives. But I'm conscious though, Carlos, of taking up space as a non-black person in this conversation without asking you how you are. Thank you for asking. And, um, you know, overall, I am I am good. It, it's interesting. It is nice to be with you both. and the different vantage points that we have age-wise. I think I have a year or two on you. I'm not sure whether it's one or two years. Yeah, me either. <laughs> but I appreciate what you had to say, uh, Ziad, about the bare minimum. And, yeah. you know, I grew up in a very different time where sadly, you know, we were so far even from the bare minimum. Yeah. Sammy, when I was your age, I would go out late at night to go get donut holes. My mom, she used to get so afraid about whether I would come home safely. And I think many moms still are, right? Yeah. Sammy, you're two for two. You keep introducing me to wonderful people. And I do have a lot of hope not to put all of the work on Gen Z, yeah. but I have a special level of respect for the thoughtfulness and the willingness to engage and the moral conscience that at least I have perceived and lots of people, but especially lots of Gen Zers. And so yeah. it makes me excited, it makes me optimistic. And I share your hope that Gen Z and that future generations can carry the torch forward and, and work collaboratively and generationally to, to do the work that needs to be done because there's a lot that we gotta do, right? Yeah. Hey, my thanks to Ziad and of course, Sammy J. Be sure to be on the lookout for more of the new in the next in our next From A to Gen Z segment. All right, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to listen, of course, you know you can enjoy the podcast. We'll see you next time right here on The Carlos Watson Show.